Kane with you, and speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Q and Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at tunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. Glasgow Times News on Thursday the 5th of October. Blevadach Outdoor Education Centre hit by vandals. An article written by Tristan Stewart-Robertson. Young lives could be at risk from repeated vandalism of an outdoor activity centre in Rue. At least £10,000 in damage has been caused to the Blevadach Outdoor Education Centre's rope course. The most recent attack was around September 19th and again saw ropes, safety nets and mats badly damaged. Particular concerns have been raised about the damage to the fall arrest nets at £1,800 each in place to catch a young person who was taking part in an activity up to four metres above a gorge. Crash mat covers were slashed, each with a £700 cost to replace. And with ropes as thick as 8 centimetres in diameter, there are fears about significant weapons being used to cut through them. Neil Whitewick, Head of Outdoor Education Services at Glasgow City Council, which runs the centre, said the vandals have broken into the locked rope course. They did so without safety equipment and ignored repeated warning signs about the dangers. He said the fall arrest nets have to be maintained to a certain safety standard – Safety is at risk if they're partly cut. We have to increase inspections to make sure nothing has been vandalised overnight. We're very concerned that our increased inspections miss a cut rope. It would be fairly catastrophic. There is a wider impact that this is having, and people coming here are carrying a significant blade. We would need specialist equipment to cut these ropes at the centre. Last year, almost 10,000 young people from around Scotland visited the centre, but bosses said the future of the route course was at risk. Mr Whitewick warned, we're making decisions whether we keep that activity open or not because we're struggling with the frequency. We're putting in cameras now and police will be pursuing parents to recover the cost of replacing vandalised parts. The most recent attack caused £3,600 worth of damage and there have been past vandalisms, including a fire. Mr Whitewick added, It's a huge cost to a public service. We all know the huge budget pressures that public services are facing. These types of services deliver once-in-a-lifetime experiences for some of the country's most vulnerable young people. Every time we need to find budget to repair and replace vandalised equipment, it reduces the funds we have available to enable more young people to attend. It's malicious damage and the knock-on effects are significant. We ask residents to be vigilant and inform the police about any suspicious activity they see around the centre. An article written by Tristan Stewart-Robertson. Glasgow Times News on Thursday the 5th of October. Broadband boost for city homes. An article issued by the Glasgow Times News Desk. Homes and businesses in Glasgow are now able to future-proof their homes and access faster and more reliable broadband. The boost is due to a new digital network rollout by City Fibre, the UK's largest independent provider of full fibre infrastructure. City Fibre started the Glasgow build in 2021, making the city one of the first locations in the UK to benefit from a full fibre upgrade. With much of the city now covered by City Fibre's full fibre network, the rollout is well underway between Thornley Bank, Newton Mearns, Clarkston and Cambus Lang. In the north of the city, work is now progressing in Gilsoch Hill, Black Hill and Clyde Bank. 
The rollout will give local homes and businesses the chance to upgrade to full fibre and future-proof their connectivity for decades to come. Paul Wakefield, City Fibre's Senior Partnership Manager for Glasgow, said... Strong digital connectivity has become the cornerstone of our daily lives, so we feel incredibly proud to be transforming the city's access to lightning-fast and super-reliable broadband. We appreciate that a project of this scale can be disruptive for residents and business owners, but would like to thank everyone for their ongoing support and their patience. This state-of-the-art network will future-proof Glasgow's digital infrastructure for the years ahead bringing with it a host of productivity, innovation and investment gains. Full fibre networks use 100% fibre optics to carry data at light speed all the way from the home to the point of connection. This gives users speeds of up to 1,000 megabits per second for upload and download, near limitless bandwidths and reliable connectivity. An article issued by the Glasgow Times news desk. Glasgow Times News on Thursday the 5th of October Council reveals recruitment woe An article written by Catherine Hunter A nationwide shortage in environmental health and food law professionals is making it harder for Glasgow City Council to recruit qualified staff to its organisation. The local authority has been trying to fill empty vacancies for additional workers, but has failed to find suitably qualified candidates and is now working with the University of the West of Scotland to tackle this issue, which is affecting all local authorities. It comes after an audit was carried out on Glasgow City Council's implementation of the Interventions Food Law Code of Practice Scotland Food Law Enforcement Services. The Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland is now acknowledging the lack of availability of qualified staff and recruitment issues and has recently updated ways people can access the profession, with applicants now being assessed on a case-by-case basis and consideration being given to previous experience. A Glasgow City Council spokeswoman said the audit was carried out in November last year and some positive progress has been achieved since then. However, a nationwide shortage of environmental health and food law professionals is making it extremely difficult for all local authorities to recruit qualified staff. We've tried to fill our vacancies and have widely advertised for additional staff, but unfortunately we've failed to find suitably qualified candidates. In order to address the issue, which is affecting all local authorities, Glasgow is working closely with the University of the West of Scotland to tackle this shortage and promote the profession as a desirable career choice. We have several students receiving valuable on-the-job training within our environmental health team, including two who have just passed their final exams. The remaining graduates will sit their professional exams over the next two years. We're also offering council staff personal development opportunities in this sector in a bid to grow our own talent and have two officers undertaking the necessary training. In the meantime, we are prioritising inspections of high-risk premises such as restaurants and takeaways and piloting new ways of working in a bid to streamline the registration process for low-risk businesses. An article written by Catherine Hunter. Glasgow Times News on Thursday the 5th of October Glasgow museum goers urged to protect thousands of years of history An article written by Caroline Wilson The cultural body that runs Glasgow's museums and galleries is urging the public to put their hands in their pockets to help safeguard the future of the city's artistic treasures Glasgow Life has launched an online marketing drive to promote its membership scheme, which entitles donors to everything Glasgow Museums has to offer, including city-run exhibitions. The price of an annual individual membership is £28, while £44 also permits the entry of a guest, and a family pass is priced at £50. Glasgow is one of the few cities in the world where entry to the majority of its museums and galleries is free. However, the parlour state of local authority finances could lead to a rethink under possible plans by the City Council. Ricky Bell, Deputy Leader of Glasgow City Council, previously warned of worse times to come and said the local authority could not continue to salami-slice services. 
He said he did not believe that Glaswegians face entry fees, but said a charging policy was something we need to consider. The council has already agreed to introduce a £3 entrance charge for the Kibble Palace in the Botanic Gardens. Councillor Bell said Glasgow was the only city that contributes significantly to the country's cultural offering, but receives no Scottish Government funding. He said Edinburgh is funded by the Scottish Government for their cultural assets. Dundee has just got significant funding for the Victoria and Albert, which is great for Dundee, but why not Glasgow? In an ideal world, we wouldn't charge for any of them, but we're not in an ideal world and we have to make difficult decisions. A message on Glasgow Life's website states that membership will help protect thousands of years of history and one of the finest art collections in Europe. The charge also entitles museum goers to discounts in museum cafes and shops and entry to all exhibitions run by Glasgow Life, but not visiting shows. Councillor Bell said the city's museums and galleries got a reasonable amount from donations. The Banksy show generated £10,000 over its 10-week run. An article written by Caroline Wilson. Glasgow Times News on Thursday, the 5th of October. Violent sex attacker terrorised his victim from Glasgow's Barlinny prison. An article written by Grant McCabe. A violent sex attacker who terrorised his victim from behind bars has been jailed for 14 years. Ryan Main, who's 32, repeatedly put the woman through a horror ordeal at a flat in Glasgow's Cran Hill. She was found naked by police before bravely revealing how she had suffered. Mr Main ended up on remand in His Majesty's prison Barlinny, but continued to hound the woman for more than a year in a series of threatening letters. In one, he stated, Do not give evidence or go to court. I have people ready to do what I say. I will make your life a misery before I burn you out of your gaff. Mr Main was sentenced as he returned to the High Court in Glasgow. He's been convicted in August of assaulting and raping the woman, as well as attempting to pervert the course of justice. Mr Main was further guilty of the same crimes against an earlier woman, which included him stating to her it was her duty to have sex with him. As well as the lengthy jail term, Judge Lord Armstrong also ordered Mr Main to be monitored for five years on his release. The physical and sexual violence involving the victim he terrorised from prison included him hitting, choking and biting the woman. Mr Main also recorded intimate footage of the victim without her knowledge when she was asleep. He was eventually held by police in March 2021 after again battering and raping the woman. The court heard he had slapped handcuffs on her and made her wear a PVC outfit. When she eventually made a bid to escape, Mr Main stopped her leaving and ripped an intercom from the wall. Mr Main was put behind bars but still plagued the woman not to testify against him. Other warnings included, Do not say anything that will get me a sentence. If you turn up in court, I will get my cousin to upload photos and videos of you. If you keep your mouth shut, I will get him to delete everything. He also threatened to flip her world upside down. Mr Main further claimed, You will become me and my people's worst enemy. He told jurors he had been a pure idiot making the remarks, but insisted it was nonsense that he was a rapist. Mr Main was convicted of a total of seven charges against this woman spanning between December 2020 and September 2022. He was also guilty of three charges of assaulting and raping the other woman between March 2016 and September 2017 at a flat in Glasgow's White Inch. Jurors heard how she had to lock herself in the bathroom with her dog to try and escape his violent clutches. This woman disclosed what had happened to her during a police probe in 2021. An article written by Grant McCabe. From the Glasgow Times, Thursday the 5th of October 2023. Lifestyle. New bar offering booze and ball games to open in Glasgow. By Drew Sandylands, local democracy reporter. A new bar offering booze and ball games can open on Argyle Street 
after the operator secured permission from council planners. Roxy Leisure Limited, which is 17 venues across the UK, has been given permission to convert a former JJB sports shop. Plans submitted on behalf of the firm described it as one of the leading operators in the UK for competitive socialising in a bar environment. According to the application, Roxy Ballrooms, aimed at 25 to 40 age range, provide social gaming, food and drink, all under one roof. Ballrooms offer a range of activities such as pool, basketball, shuffleboard and ping pong, while the firm also runs Roxy Lanes in some cities, including Edinburgh, which allow visitors to play 10-pin bowling. We create venues that are great for any size of celebration, small to large. The application stated, a place full to the brim with games but never losing that great bar atmosphere that we pride ourselves in. It added, the former JJB Sports unit has been vacant for several years and is no longer desirable as a retail unit. And as such, the building owners have reached out to leisure occupiers. It is proposed that Roxy Leisure Limited will fit out this vacant basement unit with a market-leading competitive gaming venue and provide 25 jobs for the area. The proposed development of this unit will enhance the high street and provide a more active floor space in an already vibrant location. Roxy Leisure has been given permission to open from Sunday to Wednesday between 11am and 1.30am, from 11am to 2.30am on Thursday and between 11am and 3.30am on Friday and Saturday. That article was by Drew Sandylands. From the Glasgow Times, Thursday, the 5th of October, 2023. Lifestyle. More than 35,000 people visit groundbreaking Glasgow Kelvin Grove exhibition by Anne Fotheringham, senior features writer. More than 35,000 people have visited a Glasgow exhibition dedicated to groundbreaking designer Dame Mary Quant. The popular retrospective Mary Quant Fashion Revolutionary will close on October the 22nd and organisers Glasgow Life are expecting thousands more to flock to Kelvin Grove before then. Featuring more than 100 garments, accessories, cosmetics and photographs drawn from the V&A's extensive collections, the display also includes items from the designer's own archive and many private collections. Students on Glasgow Clyde College's HND in Fashion Design and Manufacture join Glasgow Life Museum's Learning and Access Curator, Jen Keenan, at Kelvin Grove recently. Bailey Annette Christie, Chairperson of Glasgow Life, said, Dame Mary Quant's contribution to British fashion was trailblazing and the response to the show has been truly heartening. Visitors have shared their joy on reliving wonderful, sometimes forgotten memories often with younger members of their family who weren't around at the time. The v exhibition has also introduced an entirely new generation to Mary Quant's incredible influence and legacy. Lecturer Anne Wilson said, Mary Quant's affordable designer fashion was instrumental in changing how people looked at the world. It allowed an entire generation to look good and feel great. Our students are taking inspiration from her enduring legacy as they strut their stuff on the catwalk of their own fashion journey. Heather Tilbury Phillips, former director of Mary Quant Limited and advisor to v &A on the exhibition, said what is impressive is that so many of today's teenagers and young people have been overheard saying how much they would love to wear the clothes now. They seem to us to be groundbreaking, even outrageous at the time, but they have an enduring and contemporary appeal. More than a million visitors worldwide have already enjoyed Dame Mary Quant's contribution to those memorable years of 1955 to 1975. And this colourful exhibition is such fun and a fitting tribute to her revolutionary life. Jenny Lister, fashion and textiles creator at the V&A Addit. It's been great to see the appetite for the Mary Quant exhibition in Glasgow and to hear the visitors have enjoyed looking back at Mary's groundbreaking designs. This special opportunity in the final weeks for the show to spark the creativity and imagination of the fashion students from Glasgow Clyde College shows how, their, how her impact will carry on inspiring designers of the future. 
Sections of the exhibition look at the shift from couture to mass market designer fashion with the launch of the Ginger Group, how she moved fashion forward by going back and embracing the textile industry at the very heart of British manufacturing, and the way Mary Quant borrowed from the boys and manipulated menswear to challenge the conventional gender stereotypes of the day. Famous for popularising super high hem lines, the exhibition goes on to explore the story of the miniskirt, dressmaking patterns, makeup and accessories that all showcase the iconic Daisy logo. Among the objects are the pioneering wet collection, PVC rainwear, which featured in an iconic edition of Vogue, a collection of Daisy dolls created in Scotland by Lanarkshire-based model toys, and the dress Quant wore when receiving her OBE in 1966. That article was by Anne Fotheringham. Evening Times, October 6th News. Glasgow locals say somebody will die at East End Roundabout. Report by Esther Tarney. Residents of a Glasgow neighbourhood are demanding change to what they say is a dangerous roundabout. Locals in Cran Hill, in the city's east end, have warned the council that someone could die at the Carantine Road, Carantine Hall Road roundabout. This comes after the Glasgow Times reported on Monday that a cyclist was hospitalised after being hit by a van at the junction. 56-year-old Sharon Riley, who stays in the area and walks her dog on a daily basis, said, The amount of car accidents there is horrible. I think the next thing will be a fatality, because it's really bad. There have been at least 60 accidents there within the last year. Anybody who lives here will tell you, the fences, the metal railings, have been knocked away numerous times. It's people trying to beat the ones coming from Carntine Road as they come through. Family-owned business David Millen Butchers is located near the roundabout. 52-year-old employee Frank Millen said the main issue they notice is speeding, and he continued, We have known this for years and years. It's always been a problem. Cars come around speeding past, coming from the roundabouts. 53-year-old Leslie added, It's really bad, even the side streets. They just use them as rat runs. Sometimes they don't even go the right way. Both drivers, the couple said, a lot of motorists drive especially dangerously in the morning, when roads are quieter. Another worker, who works and lives in the area, suggested some roads should be made one-way streets to deal with traffic, and she said, especially in the summertime, cars just cut corners and drive carelessly. Also in the evening, there's a lot of speedy driving. Sharon, who has lived in the neighbourhood for 17 years, added, what would solve the issue is lights. We have been saying it for a long time. There's a camera on a Carantine Road, whether it's working or not, I don't know. But even trying to cross the road with a dog, it's a nightmare. It's so busy. A Police Scotland spokesperson said, Around 4.45pm on Monday, we received a report of a crash involving a van and a cyclist. The male cyclist was taken to Glasgow Royal Infirmary for treatment, and a man was charged with road traffic offences. A Glasgow City Council spokesperson said, We are aware of the recent incident at the junction between Carantine Road and Carantine Hall Road, and we understand why this has caused local concern. Prior to this incident, we have not received any recent indication of road safety concerns at this location, but we will continue to monitor the situation and take appropriate action where necessary. Report by Esther Tarney Evening Times News, October 6 Meeting held in Govan Hill over illegal fly-tipping plague Report by Sarah Hilly 
Residents in Govan Hill came face to face with the council and police at a meeting to discuss tackling the problems plaguing the area. People are worried about continuous illegal fly tipping, blighting the lanes and back courts, and say outsiders travel to the neighbourhood to use it as a dumping ground for rubbish. The Vice Chair of Crosshill and Govan Hill Community Council, Andy Carberry, said they organised a meeting last week so residents could ask questions of officials. Councillor Soraya Siddiq, Labour, believes a publicly funded task force is needed to solve the issues. Mr Carberry said, We want to get everyone involved in making the place cleaner, including shopkeepers. The meeting was about the general problems in the area, including street cleansing, refuse collection, commercial waste and back courts. Illegal fly tipping in the privately owned lanes and back courts is a concern. Explaining how the issues have been going on for years, he added, we are looking for a sustained solution in the area. We want to see a sustained presence in the area from cleansing. Mr Carberry believes the situation is improving, however, and officials are starting to take notice of the issues in Govan Hill. The council said Govan Hill gets dedicated services to tackle the problems and called on residents, owners and factors to keep back courts clean. Councillor Sadiq, who attended the meeting, said residents are frustrated over a lack of adequate services from the council and continued, the complaints include overflowing bins, missed bin collections, fly tipping, lack of enforcement, infestation and double parking. There is an urgent need for a Govan Hill task force with a resulting action plan agreed by all stakeholders and adequately funded by Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council. Govan Hill communities deserve so much better. A spokesman for Glasgow City Council said, We are working with the community to address the environmental challenges facing Govan Hill. The area has received significant resources over time and continues to receive dedicated services to address environmental issues. It is vital that owners, residents and factors play their part by keeping back courts in good order and disposing of rubbish properly at all times. Those responsible for fly tipping and other illegal dumping of waste are committing environmental crimes that leave them open to enforcement action. Anyone with any information on those responsible for fly tipping and other illegal dumping of waste should contact the police or our environmental health team so enforcement action can be taken. Making sure food waste is properly contained in a bin will help to deter rodent infestations and give pest control measures the best chance of working. Report by Sarah Haley. Evening Times News, October 6. Labour wins Rutherglen and Hamilton West by-election. Labour has overwhelmingly won Scotland's first ever recall by-election, with the party's Michael Shanks winning the Rutherglen and Hamilton West seat from the SNP. Mr Shanks was declared the new MP for the area after defeating the SNP's Katie Loudon by 17,845 votes to 8,399. The results give the new Labour MP a majority of 9,446, with Mr Shanks having polled more than 58% of the votes cast. Scottish Conservatives came in third place, with Thomas Kerr polling 1,192, ahead of Scottish Liberal Democrat candidate Gloria Adebo and Scottish Green Party candidate Cameron Eady, who secured 895 and 601 votes, respectively. A total of 30,531 votes were cast, 
with turnout standing at 37.2%, well below the 66.5% turnout in the last general election. The loss of the seat to Labour will put further pressure on SNP leader and Scottish First Minister Humza Yousaf, who has seen his party's fortunes decline in the polls in the wake of the ongoing police investigation into SNP finances. With the seat having changed hands between Labour and the SNP in the last four Westminster elections, Margaret Ferrier won it for the SNP in 2019 with a majority of 5,230 over Labour at that ballot. But she was suspended from the House of Commons for a breach of Covid rules, which saw her take the train from London to Scotland after testing positive for the virus in 2020. Ms Ferrier had the SNP whip removed swiftly in the wake of that and was later suspended from the House of Commons with that sparking the recall petition which forced yesterday's by-election vote. Mr Yousaf, who made frequent visits to the constituency during the election campaign, stressed his party was facing some very difficult circumstances, but he said the buck would stop for, for with him if his party failed to hold on to the seat. UK Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer had meanwhile insisted a win for his part in the seat would be an historic victory, which could be a milestone on Labour's journey back to power. Prior to the by-election, Labour had just one MP in Scotland with the party now hoping the result in Rutherglen and Hamilton West will be a springboard for the next general election, expected to be held sometime next year. Mr Shanks said afterwards it was the honour of his life to be elected as MP for the area. Evening Times News, October 6. M&S workers doing strictly after colleagues' cancer battle. Report by Taylor Murray. A group of Glasgow M&S workers are set to swap the shop floor for the big lights as they look to take on a Strictly Come Dancing charity event. Dubbed Strictly Beatson, six colleagues from several M&S stores across Glasgow will raise money that will go to a specialised cancer care centre at the Beatson, west of Scotland. It will take place tomorrow at Double Tree by Hilton, Glasgow Central. Christopher Gilmer, Claire Williams and Sarah Young from M&S Silverburn have formed a dancing troupe alongside their former colleagues Adam McMinn from M&S Brayhead, Gillian Gilmer from M&S Newton Mearns and Amy Strayton from M&S Argyle Street. As a group, Christopher, Claire, Sarah, Adam, Gillian and Amy have little or no dance experience between them and have been trained by professional dancers, husband and wife pair Pamela Logan and Ian Peebles since August to help them take on the dance floor. The supermarket workers are aiming to raise £8,500 in total, with the group having already reached over 95% of their target ahead of the event. The High Street retailer will also be donating £1,000 in addition to the total amount raised in support of the charity. The group is sponsored by M&S Silverburn store manager Linda Murray, who was inspired to support the organisation after receiving treatment there herself. Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2004 and again in 2007 and in both occurrences received outstanding care from Beetson West. Linda said, After attending Strictly Beetson as a guest last year, I was determined to get a group of dancers together for 2023. My team is made up of six colleagues from four M&S stores across Scotland West, all of whom have loved the experience being trained by professional dancers and learning a new skill. 
I am looking forward to seeing them hit the dance floor and am proud of the efforts M&S has made to raise money for Beats and West, a charity that is very close to my heart. Report by Taylor Murray Evening Times News, October 6 Man attacked in Kirkintilloch Report by Kirsty Fierick A man was attacked in Kirkintilloch, sparking a serious assault probe. The 54-year-old was hospitalised after the incident, which happened between 6.45pm and 7.45pm in the Hillhead Road area of the town. The assault happened near the roundabout with East Side on Monday. It comes as he sustained a serious injury and was taken to Glasgow Royal Infirmary and released following treatment. Detective Constable Kara Nichols said, Our inquiries are ongoing to establish the full circumstances and we are keen to speak to anyone who saw what happened. It is a busy part of town, so please think back and if you were in the area and witnessed this assault, let us know. Likewise, if you are driving in the area and have dash cam footage that could assist with our investigation, then get in touch. Anyone with information is asked to contact Police Scotland on 101, quoting incident number 3431 of Monday 2 October 2023, or make a call anonymously to Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Report by Kirsty Fierick Evening Times News, October 6 Police Scotland cop sexually assaulted another officer. Report by Connor Gordon A police constable recorded groping another officer on a night out has been ordered to do 150 hours of unpaid work. Martin O'Neill inappropriately touched the woman at Glasgow's Bar Home on April 10th, 2022. The married 42-year-old was inadvertently captured on camera after a colleague filmed O'Neill due to how drink he was. It led to him being reported to his Police Scotland bosses. Shamed O'Neill appeared at Glasgow Sheriff Court where he pleaded guilty to a charge of sexual assault. It emerged O'Neill, who only joined the force in 2019, resigned before appearing in the dock. The now warehouse worker was put on the sex offenders register for 12 months at Thursday's sentencing. The first offender was also placed under supervision for 12 months. Sheriff Mary Shields said, this is the most appropriate disposal. The court earlier heard how the night out had occurred at the bar in Glasgow's Merchant City. Prosecutor Caitlin McAllister said, O'Neill was seen by colleagues placing his hand on the woman's thigh for a minute or two. Other officers saw him touching her there at various points during the night. O'Neill was described as very drunk in the pub. Miss McAllister said, At 11.45pm an officer recorded O'Neill. While doing this he caught O'Neill using his left hand to cup the victim's upper right thigh towards her buttocks a few times. Some of his concerned colleagues messaged each other about how uncomfortable the victim looked. Describing another incident that night, Miss McAllister said, O'Neill was seen reach over with his hand and try to slap the victim on her buttocks. He missed and made contact with her rear upper thigh area. The victim later confronted O'Neill, who apologised for his conduct. The matter was then reported, leading to O'Neill being charged. Christopher Shaw defending told the sensing that he was at work's night out and does not socialise much. He took more alcohol than he was used to. He had a good working relationship with the victim and he acknowledges in his drunkenness that he was over familiar. My client accepts his conduct was inappropriate. 
this is a one-off incident and there is no realistic way of this occurring. Report by Connor Gordon. Gordon. Evening Times News, October 6. Police take no action over Nicola Sturgeon comment by Prime Minister. Report by Kirsty Fierick. Police will take no action against the Prime Minister for his Nicola Sturgeon comment. Detectives will not investigate further after the Alapa party complained about a comment Rishi Sunak made about the former SNP leader. The party, led by Alex Salmond, made a complaint against the PM, who poked fun at the former First Minister after she was arrested and questioned as part of Police Scotland's investigation into her party's finances, dubbed Operation Branch Forum. Ms Sturgeon was released without charge following her arrest in June. Chris McElhenney, General Secretary of the Alapa Party, reported Mr Sunak to the force for contempt of court allegations on Wednesday. The Conservative leader who was addressing his party's conference in Manchester made the comments as he claimed the union between Scotland and the rest of the UK was the strongest it had been in a quarter of a century, with the Prime Minister adding that the forces of separatism are in retreat. Mr McElhenney said that Operation Branch Forum should be free to pursue its investigation fearlessly without interference from Rishi Sunak, adding as a result he was formally complaining about the offence of contempt of court, requesting a police investigation. The Alapa General Secretary added, The Prime Minister is commenting on and making an assumption about a live Police Scotland investigation. In Scotland, contempt applies from arrest, not from charging. Operation Branch Form is investigating serious matters of the utmost importance to the Scotland and trust in politics. It is too important a matter to allow interference from the Prime Minister in this act of contempt when many people await the facts of Police Scotland's investigation. However, Police Scotland have now confirmed they would be taking no action against the Prime Minister for the comments. A spokesperson said, We have received a complaint and following consultation with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, no police action is being taken at this time. Report by Kirsty Fierig. This is from the Glasgow Times on Friday the 6th of October 2023. From the Lifestyle section. Inside the Glasgow School, covered in incredible murals over 17 walls, this exclusive article is written by Ava White. A Glasgow primary school has been given a bright and bold makeover by talented pupils and a local street artist. 17 walls in and around the grounds of Corpus Christi Primary in Knightswood were transformed over the summer with incredible murals of animals, birds and sea creatures. The artwork was designed during workshops hosted by Southside street artist Stephen Machin, also known as Mac Colours, at the Pikeman Road School between June and July and completed by early August. Stephen told the Glasgow Times that he was initially asked to design three walls at the school, but the youngster's incredible creativity meant the project was expanded. He said... I previously worked at another school in Rutherglen, and I think the head teacher at Corpus Christi had spotted my work on X. I was then invited to initially do three walls and had started drawing up designs for them. We held workshops at the school and pupils from primaries four to seven got involved. During the workshops we were able to create the murals by identifying things in the school that best represented creative learning such as literacy. The three walls turned into five as the kids and teachers were having so much fun with it and it was proving to be good for the kids' self-esteem. It actually ended up being 17 walls in total, 
I think there's some sort of rule now that schools aren't allowed to put paper up on the walls or blue tack anything up, as it's a fire hazard, and they, the school, felt the walls were kind of drab compared to what schools used to look like, but that's where the kids' creativity came in. They were amazing. Stephen, who has been a graffiti artist for 21 years now, was also tasked with designing each of the school's three stairways over the summer holidays as a surprise for the pupils. Taking inspiration from local wildlife and featuring animals from exotic locations, he painted birds native to the Jordan Hill area, a red-eyed tree frog, a whale and a squirrel. The 33-year-old explained that his ultimate goal with the project was to inspire the children to believe in themselves. He recalled an experience as a child that pushed him to pursue a creative career. Stephen added, When I work in schools, my aim is always to tell kids that their ideas are valued and that they are all talented. When I was about 10 or 11, I went to an open day with my mum and whilst I was left to my own devices, I came across a street artist who was there. He had a vinyl sign and was doing a workshop on street art. Now, I was too young at the time to realise what was going on, but I still enjoyed myself, and that feeling never left me when I started to get into graffiti. I'll always remember that guy, and I wanted to pass that feeling on to the youth of today, especially with the explosion of street art in Glasgow and the wider area. I believe that if you have passion and an idea, you can do it. I'm not trained in any of the arts. The most I've done is graphic design at college and a bit of landscape designing. I want to embolden children who may only see the graffiti and tagging side of this. I want them to know the first time they pick up a spray paint can shouldn't be in angst or in a rebellious way. It's about being creative and having a part in making their community brighter. That article was written by Ava White. This is from the Glasgow Times on 6th of October 2023 from the Lifestyle section. Paisley Fireworks event not set to return. Here's why. This article is written by Jacob Nicholl. Renfrewshire Council has confirmed that there are no plans for the return of its fireworks event in Paisley. The annual display has not taken place since 2019. The event was scrapped in 2020 and 2021 due to the coronavirus pandemic. Last year, the local authority did not reveal why the display did not go ahead. Today, a spokesperson for Renfrewshire Council said, The Paisley Fireworks event has not taken place since 2019 and there are no plans for it to return. We took a decision to prioritise events which take place over a longer period and drive footfall and spend in our town centres. This means that more opportunities for people to join in and greater benefits for businesses. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 6th of October 2023 from the Lifestyle section. Paolo Nutini album celebrated as a classic with top award. This article is written by Rebecca Newlands. Paolo Nutini's iconic debut album has been recognised as a classic with an award. The Paisley singer-songwriter's 2006 record These Streets has been selected as this year's Modern Scottish Classic Award at the Scottish Album of the Year SAY Awards. Created in association with YouTube, the accolade is an annual recognition of an iconic album from Scotland's past that still inspires artists today. Spanning singles including New Shoes and Last Request, These Streets is described as an instant classic which catapulted a then 19-year-old Nutini into fame and recognition. It was his first of four critically acclaimed albums and went on to sell over 1.5 million copies in the UK. Lizzie Dixon, head of label relations at YouTube UK, said, These Streets is a stunning, timeless record from a sensational talent that reflects Scottish artistry at its finest. 
Paolo Nutini sets new standards for lyrical and vocal quality with this debut, and he continues to inspire artists and fans around the world. YouTube is committed to celebrating all music talent, both old and new, so we are proud to sponsor the Modern Scottish Classic Award. These Streets was chosen by the 20 artists who were long-listed for the Say Album of the Year Award, which we previously reported including Nutini for his latest release, Last Night in the Bittersweet. The other artists who made this year's shortlist for the award are Andrew Woslick, Becky Sikaza, Bems, Brooke Coombe, Cloth, Hamish Hawke, Joseph and Young Fathers. Robert Kilpatrick, Interim CEO and Creative Director of the Scottish Music Industry Association, SMIA, added, Congratulations to the incredible albums that have made the Say Award shortlist, as well as to our Sound of Young Scotland Award finalists, and this year's Modern Scottish Classic Award winner, Paolo Nutini's iconic debut, These Streets. This is a fantastic representation of the strength and diversity of Scottish music, past, present and future. That article was written by Rebecca Newlands. This is from the Glasgow Times on Friday the 6th of October 2023. From the Lifestyle section. Two Scottish restaurants named among UK's best by TripAdvisor. This article is written by Andrew Smart. Two Scottish eateries have been named among the best of the best in the UK for fine dining by travel comparison website TripAdvisor. The prestigious list of 10 restaurants forms part of the company's Traveller's Choice Awards, seeing the best establishment in the world recognised. The rankings were based on reviews and opinions from TripAdvisor users over a 12-month period with each winner having passed a rigorous assessment. Only 1% of the 8 million restaurants and eateries on the website have been awarded this year. Two Scottish restaurants were named among the 10 best fine dining experiences in the UK by TripAdvisor, with one hailing from the nation's capital and another coming from Fife. The Kitchen in Edinburgh, that's spelt K-I-T-C-H-I-N in Edinburgh was ranked third best in the UK and 13th globally with a 4.5 to 5 rating out of 4,375 user reviews. The eatery has also been awarded one Michelin star and serves a mixture of French and British cuisine. The kitchen's TripAdvisor description reads The kitchen presents modern British seasonal cuisine influenced by French cooking techniques and an appreciation of the best quality ingredients available from Scotland's fantastic natural larder. The cellar, which also has a Michelin star in Anstruther, Fife, followed closely behind in fifth place with a rating of 5 out of 5 out of 584 reviews. The eatery's TripAdvisor description says it is a small, unique Scottish restaurant tucked away just off the main street in Anstruther. That article was written by Andrew Smart. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 9th of October. The Erskine Bridge closed for a full weekend due to improvements. An article written by Tom Grant. Part of the Erskine Bridge will be closed for a full weekend as £250,000 worth of improvement works are carried out. The southbound carriageway will be shut to traffic for three nights and two full days from Thursday, October 26th until Monday, October 30th. The road connecting from the A82 and the slip road off to the A726 will also be closed. Transport infrastructure company Amy says the essential improvements are needed for the bridge as it welcomes around 10,000 vehicles on the route every day. In a statement, Amy, on behalf of Transport Scotland, said the total value of the works represents an around £250,000 investment in local infrastructure 
and will benefit around 10,000 vehicles using this route each day by improving the condition of the carriageway, maintaining the structure of this key route linking the southwest and northwest of Scotland, and reducing the need for more extensive maintenance in the future. Completing these maintenance and improvement schemes together will minimise disruption for local residents, businesses and the travelling public. Where possible, public transport routes are being maintained and providers are being supported to adjust their services, with further details available from bus companies and from Travelline Scotland. The programme of works includes bridge joint replacements, resurfacing and patching of the bridge deck and the southbound off-slip, electrical road crossing works and road markings. A sign diversion will operate for southbound traffic, but the northbound A898 will remain open throughout these works. An article written by Tom Grant. Glasgow Times News on Monday, the 9th of October. Flood chaos in Glasgow. An article written by Esther Tarnay. Glasgow and surrounding areas were hit with severe flooding over the weekend as residents faced extreme rainfall. ScotRail shared photographs of several stations which were underwater, including Bowling, Thornley Bank, Dalmarnock and Greenock West. Glasgow Times readers have also sent in pictures of flooding, including in Pollock in the south side. An amber weather warning was in place across the city and the Met Office warned that the flooding and rainfall could cause severe disruptions. As the Glasgow Times reported online over the weekend, several bus and train links were disrupted and roads were flooded across the city. ScotRail warned customers yesterday that services were still badly affected by the extreme weather. Repair works and safety inspections are underway at railway lines after some areas saw up to a month's worth of rain in a 24-hour period. David Simpson, ScotRail's service delivery director, said The weather we've seen over the weekend has been extreme and in some parts of the country we are continuing to see dangerous levels of rainfall and flooding. We appreciate that weather-related disruption like this can be frustrating, but our first priority has to be the safety of the public and our colleagues. Our staff across the country, alongside colleagues at Network Rail, are working hard to get services back to normal as quickly and safely as possible, with the priority being getting things back to normal for Monday morning. Customers are advised that they should check their journey before travelling and keep an eye on our website, app or social media feeds for live updates. The horrendous weather also proved challenging for many workers, including a food delivery driver who demonstrated his dedication to making sure a customer received their Just Eat order. A video was shared of the man making his way along Drummore Road in the city's Drum Chapel on Saturday, despite it being flooded. The TikTok clip is captioned, telling you something. He'd better get a tip. On Monday morning, ScotRail issued a further update, saying we're still trying to recover from the very heavy rain and flooding that was seen over the weekend, and services will not be able to run in many areas. These include Edinburgh and Glasgow Queen Street to Inverness, and Glasgow Queen Street to Aberdeen, Dundee, Perth and Arbroath. Further north, the Inverness to Carla Lochalsh line remains closed. An article written by Esther Tarnay. Glasgow Times News on Monday, the 9th of October. 11 year old girl returns to the hospital that saved her life. An exclusive article written by Anne Fotheringham. The sign is blue and bright, and the words are straight to the point. Never give up is the message 11-year-old Scarlett Dugan wanted included in the redesigned operating theatres at Glasgow's Royal Hospital for Children. It sums up this West End schoolgirl who had life-saving heart surgery when she was a baby, just metres away from where the new sign now sits. Scarlett, who lives in Broomhill with her parents Nicola and Peter, brothers Nathaniel and Philip and her sister Delilah, has hypoplastic right heart syndrome, where the right side of the heart is underdeveloped, affecting the flow of oxygen around the body. Scarlett and fellow former patient Riley McLennan from Inverness, whose cancer is now in remission thanks to a life-saving stem cell transplant, were invited back to the hospital to mark an important milestone. 
The duo helped paediatric cardiac anaesthetist Dr Alison Walker officially open the first phase of the £1 million theatre improvement initiative, a pioneering programme designed to transform the experience of young patients and their families within operating theatres. Dr Walker, who has raised tens of thousands of pounds for the project, said For children, parents and caregivers, visiting the operating theatre can be a daunting experience. We wanted to transform our theatre environment into one filled with empathy so that children, their families and staff will feel calmer and more welcomed. A more empathic environment will lead to less anxiety, greater satisfaction, less emergence delirium, less post-op nausea and vomiting and less pain relief requirements. The £1 million initiative included renovation of the reception area and the creation of the Wee Room, a peaceful sanctuary where parents and carers can take a moment. Nicola admits returning to the operating theatres was very emotional. I don't think it really hit me until I was standing there, she says. The last time I was in that room, I was handing over my daughter to the surgeons. The transformation is incredible. It was so clinical before. It's much more human now. And I think the more distractions, the better for a child and parents in that situation. She pauses. Those days were so challenging, the worst days of my life. Since Scarlett's first operation, Nicola and her husband Peter have organised an annual fundraising ball for Glasgow Children's Hospital Charity and the British Heart Foundation. This year it's taking place at the Crown Plaza Hotel on November the 4th. This is the 10th ball and it feels like a huge milestone, says Nicola, who is a teacher. Our first one was a chance to say thank you to all those who supported us during Scarlett's diagnosis and first open-heart surgery. We were blown away by the generosity of our friends, family and local businesses and so many people asked us when the next one was. It turned into an annual event. She adds, smiling, because it's the 10th anniversary, this year will be a bit special. Around 300 people from all over the country are coming to this year's event, which includes a sparkling reception, a three-course meal, games, a raffle and auction, live music, pizza at midnight and a DJ until 2am. Money raised will help support families and fund research. There is no cure for Scarlett's condition. Scarlett is amazing. She is well and she copes really well, says her proud mum. We've been told she will need a heart transplant, probably around her late teens. People ask us all the time, so is she on the waiting list? But she's not, because she doesn't need to be. If a heart was to become available for a child who needed it right now, it's right that they should get it. Moving up to high school has been a huge milestone for the family, says Nicola. At her primary seven leaver service, there were lots of emotions going on, she admits. I was looking at all the parents watching their little ones and knowing they were thinking, what's next for them and what will this next chapter be? It hit me right then that we don't know what the next chapter will be for Scarlett. One day her heart will start to fail and that's when she will go onto the transplant list and we will deal with that day when it comes. That's why we've been fundraising for the last ten years and why, when we're asked to do things like this, like cutting the ribbon, we don't hesitate. It's a way of saying thank you to the hospital for keeping Scarlett alive and hopefully of changing the future for her and for others like her. An exclusive article written by Anne Fotheringham. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 9th of October. Man trapped in his house used a kayak to leave his home. An article written by Sarah Ping. A Glasgow man said he felt trapped in his own home and resorted to using a kayak to access the road due to flooding in the city. Michael Patterson from Bamulloch paddled away from his home in a kayak after Leadburn Road flooded on Saturday after heavy downpours. The 32-year-old man said the road was prone to flooding and he'd needed to replace three cars in two years due to water damage. He said he was frustrated and used his kayak to highlight the situation. He said, 
The flooding makes all the residents frustrated as we get flooded in and can't get to the shop, take the children to school or go to work, which makes us feel trapped in our own homes. Myself and others have lost cars or have had to pay for damages. I have lost three cars due to this. He said Glasgow City Council should take responsibility for the flooding. He said the council is taking no responsibility and the issue with the drainage has been ongoing for a matter of years. For as long as I can remember, it's always been an issue in this street. At times there's been sewage floating about. A spokesman for Glasgow City Council said staff have worked around the clock to clear the water after it received reports of flooding on Saturday. He said, Unfortunately, we did not receive any reports of flooding in Leadburn Road yesterday. We did receive 91 different reports of flooding in Glasgow over the course of Saturday and our teams worked round the clock through difficult conditions to get all of these incidents cleared. He added that a team from the council visited Leadburn Road yesterday and urged residents to contact the council if they encounter flooding. He said, if there are further flooding incidents at this location, then they should be reported directly to the council and we will investigate further. Scotland was hit by relentless rainfall starting on Saturday and continuing through the night, causing travel disruption on roads and on railways. Those in the north of Scotland have been warned that there is still a risk to life from severe flooding. An article written by Sarah Ping. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 9th of October. Winter fuel payments could be removed for most pensioners. An article written by Molly Court. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is considering removing the winter fuel payment scheme from all who are currently eligible, other than the poorest pensioners. It's thought that this will be implemented by Mr Sunak to keep his pledge over the pension triple lock, regardless of its spiralling costs. Government figures have told Sky News that he understands the politics of the triple lock and knows he has no option but to recommit to it, as the pensioner vote is vital to his campaign. It's been reported that officials are drawing up proposals to remove the winter fuel allowance from all pensioners except those who receive pension credit. A government source told the broadcaster, Mr Sunak understands the politics of the triple lock, although he thinks it's far from fair from an intergenerational point of view, so he's trying to redress that a little bit. Mr Sunak has yet to address the speculation and has so far refused to commit to honouring the triple lock. This increases pensions each year by whichever is highest out of average earnings, inflation or 2.5%. It's expected that the triple lock could cost as much as £45 billion a year by 2050. A government spokesperson said, We have protected pensioners with the biggest state pension increase in history this year, as well as boosting pension credit, worth around £3,500 a year for those on the lowest incomes. On top of winter fuel payments, pensioners will get another £300 this winter to help with essential costs, and we're bearing down on inflation to make everyone's money go further. However, they also said that they would not comment on the rumours ahead of the annual autumn review of pensions and benefits. Sky News explains the winter fuel payment is a tax-free handout from the government to help people of pension age pay for their fuel and heating bills. Ministers set a date each year that defines eligibility. For 2023-2024, anyone born before the 25th of September 1957 could get between £250 and £600 to help pay for bills this winter. An article written by Molly Court. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 10th of October, from the news section, Man found dead in Clyde Bank, report by Eva White. A man has been found dead in Clyde Bank. Police were called to a grass area off of Great Western Road, E82, shortly after 10am on Monday. Officers said the man was pronounced dead at the scene. It is believed there are no suspicious circumstances surrounding the death. A report will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. A police conference spokesperson said, Around 10.05am, 
on Monday, October the 9th, a man was found off the A82 Clyde Bank. He was pronounced dead at the scene. There would not appear to be any suspicious circumstances surrounding the death and the report will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. If you are struggling, contact the Samaritans on 116-123. And the article was by Eva White. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 10th of October, from the news section, Shelter Scotland to take to Glasgow streets for World Homelessness Day. Report by Morgan Carmichael. Shelter Scotland will be taking to Glasgow streets to mark World Homeless Day today. Staff and volunteers of the well-known charity will be on our Girl Street at 12pm issuing a Housing SOS today. In a minute of noise, the charity will be highlighting the increasing number of people experiencing homelessness and asking the public to join in as they demand urgent action to address the city's worsening housing emergency. Shelter Scotland Director Alison Watson said Glasgow's housing emergency is devastating lives so we're sending out a housing SOS. A household becomes homeless every 16 minutes on average while 45 kids each day lose their home in Scotland. What's so frustrating is that it doesn't have to be like this. We know that by delivering social homes the government can end our housing emergency and give hope to the thousands of people across Scotland experiencing homelessness. That's why this World Homeless Day We're out on the streets of Glasgow not only demanding urgent action from those in power, but urging the public to join our fight as well. At 12pm, we'll join together to make a noise that politicians can't ignore to demand what they make sure everyone in Glasgow has somewhere to call home and to remind them that none of us will be quiet until the job is done. And that report was by Morgan Carmichael. From the Glasgow Times... Tuesday the 10th of October, from the news section, Wish a man who raped vulnerable women in Woodland jailed. Article by James Mulholland. A man who choked a vulnerable woman moments before raping her in Woodland has been jailed for six years. James Weir, 40, preyed on the female, who cannot be named for legal reasons, at Landon Lark Hall on August 17th, 2020. The High Court in Lanark heard how we are forced his victim onto the ground before compelling her to take off her clothes. He also placed his hands on her throat and compressed it before raping her. Weir, of Wishaw, was found guilty of rape following a trial last month. Judge Lord Summers deferred sentence in order to obtain a report on his background. The accused was remanded in custody. On Tuesday... Weir's case called again at the High Court in Edinburgh where he observed proceedings via video link from prison. Defence advocate Ian Smith asked Lord Summers to be as lenient as he could be in the circumstances. He added, I invite your lordship to impose a sentence which is appropriate for the the offence. Passing sentence, Lord Summers told Weir, I have heard all that has been said in mitigation by Mr Smith and I have taken it all into account. However, you have been convicted of a very serious offence. I have taken account of the vulnerability of your victim and I have decided that a sentence of six years is the most appropriate sentence. And that article was by James Mulholland. Evening Times, October 11. Lifestyle. Popular Festival announces celebration events for Glasgow Film Theatre. Report by Taylor Murray A popular festival has announced that they will be holding a special event to mark Glasgow Film Theatre turning 50. The much-loved festival, which is run by Glasgow Film, a charity which also runs Glasgow Film Theatre, will bring immersive special events featuring films to mark three historic milestones in 2024. The events are set to take place between Wednesday, February 28 and Sunday, March 10, 2024. With the Glasgow Film Festival hosting its 20th edition of the festival, plans are underway to mark the 85th anniversary of the Cosmo Cinema 
which opened in 1939 and in 1974 became Glasgow Film Theatre, GFT, making next year its 50th birthday. To mark the occasion, the Glasgow Film Theatre will present three of their immersive special events featuring films drawn from each of those years. Glasgow Film Festival is made possible by support from Screen Scotland, the BFI Audience Projects Fund, awarding National Lottery funding and Glasgow Life. The charity also announced a special preview of Girl, taking place on Friday 17 November at the Glasgow Film Theatre ahead of its general release. Alison Gardner, CEO of Glasgow Film and Director of GFF, said, We are very excited to be announcing our plans to mark an important year for Glasgow Film during GFF 2024. Glasgow Film Festival's special events have always been very popular with film fans, and these classic screenings are set to be another memorable festive moment. A Q&A with director Adura Onashil will accompany the screening of Girl at the Glasgow Film Theatre. Report by Taylor Murray Evening Times, October 11 Lifestyle What You Need to Know About Glasgow Fort Fireworks Show Report by Ben Waddle As Bonfire Night gets closer, here's what you need to know about the Glasgow North East Fireworks Festival. It will take place on Saturday, November 5 at Glasgow Fort and the event will kick off at 11am and finish at 10 p.m. It will include a fireworks display and a range of entertainment, including performances from local musicians, a fun fair, and a live wrestling show. On top of that, there will also be a selection of pop-up food stalls, as well as the restaurants in the shopping area. Key timings of the event. The free festival will open at 12 p.m with stage performances starting from 12.15pm, including music from the Wee Garage Band at 5pm and songs from The Drifters and Motown at 6pm. The fireworks display will then take place from 7.30pm and the final act closing the event will take place between 8pm and 9.30pm. Key information for the event Funfair rides at the festival will be subject to a small cost. Alcohol will be prohibited at the event and sparklers will also be banned for safety. For those travelling to the fort for the event, walking or taking public transport is being recommended by the organisers. However, those travelling by car will be able to park in designated festival car parks including Glasgow Club Easter House, the Lochs Shopping Centre and Platform, and the Art Centre on Westerhouse Road. Meanwhile, Glasgow's Fort will remain open as usual throughout the day. Report by Ben Waddle. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.